Well, let me give you all a very warm welcome to Cumber Free Presbyterian Church for our services today, both upstairs and down. We're delighted to see you all, and we warmly welcome you in our Saviour's name. Still some folks making their way into the house of God. So we welcome you all, and we trust the Lord will bless you and your family. And also to those that are joining on the live stream, we do have quite a number of individuals. We have an online community who keep in touch with us, encourage us, send us text messages, emails, phone calls, and we meet you out and about, and we're thankful for your support. We know that it has been a blessing to you to be able to tune in, and we trust that today, both you and your family, any others that are listening, that God would richly bless his word to you your heart. As we say, we're glad to see you all, both upstairs and down, young and old. And you'll forgive me if I single out some friends who are with us today. Good to see Desi and Dorothy, uh, very faithful attendees at our church in Lisburn, and were very encouraging to me and still are in my ministry over many, many years. I I count them as dear friends and delighted to have them here with us today. And also their wider family circle. I found myself like part of the family. I do remember uh, Mara's uh, 90th birthday, and uh, the whole family was invited, and the only outsiders was myself and June, and we felt so privileged, and we just felt part, and we still do feel such a part with the family. And also good to have uh, Alan and Karen with us as well. Uh, they're living in Scotland, in Carstairs, and they're over, and we're delighted to see them. The last time I think we were with them, we were over, over in Scotland, and they were very hospitable to us, very kind. Uh, Alan has, you're an artist, aren't you, Alan? You still do a bit of painting, do you? Uh, I have a, f a painting in the house, he did, and whenever we moved from Lisburn, it got pride of place between the kitchen and the conservatory. We often look at it, and we think of our day we spent there, down, and it's just very graphic the way he has captured that painting. But we're delighted to see uh, Dorothy and Desi and also Alan and Karen, and we welcome you all. And if you're a visitor here today, we don't want you to feel out of place, but we're glad to see you, and we warmly welcome everyone, young and old alike, in the Saviour's wonderful name. We're turning to the hymn 381, please, 381. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. As I said, my favourite author, Johnson Oatman Jr., and uh, he's really saying in the worst of times, you're to count your blessing. If you notice in verse 1, now you wouldn't want to be like this all the time. When upon life's billows your tempest tossed, you wouldn't want to be with the waves crashing in upon you every day of your life. And then look at verse 2. Uh, are you ever burdened with a load of care? You certainly wouldn't want to have every day like that. And then look at verse 3. When you look at others with their lands and gold and poverty... Uh, and uh, seeing everybody else prosper and you just in debt to the eyeballs. And then look at verse 4. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, I want to tell you whether you're on the, the mountaintop, whether you're in these times. And he has outlined in the hymn the worst of times, the worst of times. And he says, even then you can still count your blessings. Well, I would even love to add a fifth verse to this if I had the skill to write, and I may do it. Who knows? And just add one when you're on the mountaintop. Uh, when you're in blessing, when you're happy, when things are good in your life, you could still count your blessings and name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has actually done in your life and mine. So let's sing this heartily as unto the Lord. After the key, we'll stand. Let's all stand as we worship.
That's good singing. We do appreciate that. We want to bow briefly in prayer, and we're going to seek the Lord's face. I remind you that this Thursday, in the will of God, over in our Money Slain Free Presbyterian Church, it will be the wedding of Isaac McKee to Hannah Skelly. Uh, that's at 12 noon, and Money Slain. So if you could remember Isaac and Hannah in your prayers, they join in holy matrimony on Thursday, the 28th of March, this Thursday coming at 12 noon. And I trust the Lord will put his hand upon them as they join hand in hand, and God would go with them in this journey in life. We pray for the McKee and the Skelly family circles that God would richly bless, uh, not only bringing two individuals together, but two families in the divine will. So we pray the Lord's blessing upon Isaac and upon Hannah in the final preparations. I'm sure Isaac's all worried about it. I'm sure he's all concerned about it. That is the farm I'm talking about, not the wedding. And he needs to get it all sorted before he gets to Thursday. So I'm sure he'll be well scrubbed up for that. Uh, but we want to assure them that we'll be thinking about you and praying for them in the divine will. Let's just buy briefly in prayer. And I know on a sadder note, we could remember uh, that family circle and the town of Kil Kilkeel and what has happened in that tragedy down in the kingdom of Morn. Loving Father, we thank thee for today, for a real sense of the divine presence from early morning. Lord, from we believe when you woke us up, there was no alarm, but heaven awakened us this morning. And we bless thee, Lord, from the early hours we were talking to thee. We were communing with heaven. We were fellowshipping with our God. We were spending time at the cross. We were drawing closer to the Lord. We were seeking after God. We're bringing many things to thee. We're unburdening our hearts before thee. Lord, we were talking to thee about so many things. And thou, God, seest me. Lord, you know all about us today. You know the petitions that we have presented. You know, Lord, the supplications that we have made. You know the heart cry to God. You know the desire of our heart. You know our prayers. You've heard those prayers. We can trust thee and we can leave them in thy hand, knowing that thou art a God who answers prayer. And we bless thee, Lord, that things may not change in our lives, but we'll have that inward calm. We'll have that settled peace. We'll be better prepared, having spent time with thee and waiting on God to deal with all matters that surround us and come our way today and this incoming week. And we bless thee, Lord, we can cast our care upon Christ, for he cares for us. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, the psalmist said. And Father, we want to do that today. We want to bring our burdens to thee. And Lord, we thank thee and bless thee. You are the burden bearer. You bore that awful load of sin at Calvary on thine own body, sinlessly perfect. Thou didst die for our sins. Take our place on the cross. Thou didst suffer bleed and die and rise again. And we bless thee, Father, for a perfect Savior. We rejoice we're not trusting in our church. We're not looking to ourselves and our own good works. We're not looking, Lord, to our own morality, the things we do and don't do. We bless thee, Lord, it's not what I have done, not what these hands have done. Lord, can give me peace with God. But we bless thee, it's the blood of Christ that was shed for us as a sacrifice for sin. And that, Lord, satisfies divine justice and turns away divine wrath from our soul. And we rejoice all, it's because of Calvary. And we count our many blessings today, the temporal and spiritual blessings we have. We would seek to name them one by one as we have sought to do today. And we thank thee it has surprised us how much the Lord has done for us. And as a congregation, we're truly thankful. As a denomination, as part of the body of Christ, we're truly grateful for every token of thy love and mercy. And we lift our hearts today in worship, praise, and adoration of thee, our God. We pray you'll be with us through today, Lord. We look to thee now to take control of every meeting. Remember, not only now in the morning and afternoon service, this family time for worship. Remember again this afternoon for 
the Sunday School Teachers Prayer Meeting. Remember, Lord, the season of prayer before the meeting tonight. Remember, as thy servants come to share their testimony, Lord, to tell us what the Lord has done for them in their lives. We pray you'll bless Aidan. Remember Chris, Lord, even Rory as he travels up from Dublin. We pray, Lord, you will remember these men as they take part tonight. We ask too, Lord, for the family and friends, Lord, that will gather in the house as we have sought to invite, Lord, as we have sought, Lord, to ask folks to come along to hear the testimony. God, grant that you'll bring them in. We thank thee, Lord, you have been working in the congregation. We thank thee for souls this year already who have repented and believed and trusted Christ as their Savior. For many who have come under the influence of the gospel, we bless thee, our Father, for those who have heard uh, Christ and him crucified. And we pray that even yet, Lord, others will come to know him, whom to know is life eternal. We pray especially for thy blessing upon the services today. We ask, Lord, for that spirit of attentiveness, Lord, for the lengthening of the concentration span. Take away every distraction, every wandering thought from our minds. Cover this meeting beneath the blood of the Lamb. Shut out the world and the devil, Lord, and the temptations, Lord, of the flesh. And grant, Lord, that in the spirit we might worship God, we might honor the Lord, we might glorify Christ. Remember the reading of Holy Scripture, the worship, the offering of prayer and praise of thy dear people. Remember too, Lord, the preaching forth of the word. And in our going and coming from the house of God today, may we know the blessing of the Lord that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow with it. And then, Lord, we remember those who are sick and sorrowing today. They're on the prayer list, Lord. Thou knowest each and every individual, Lord. We just bring them to thee, and we pray over them, for them, and about them. And we ask, Lord, you'll minister to their need. Some in hospital, Lord. Remember them today. We, Lord, pray for Lord Anne Stanix, we pray, Lord, you'll be with Anne and you'll undertake for her. We ask, Lord, that you'll draw near in a very real way. And we ask, Lord, you'll minister to her need. And we pray, Lord, you will be pleased even now, Lord, just to draw near and to undertake for all and for every need. Remember Frida Hamilton, Lord. We pray for Frida and we ask that you'll draw near. Remember Stella Hicks today, Lord. Others in hospital who need a touch from God. We pray for some who are recovering at home and those who, oh God, have been bereaved this past while. Remember especially the town of Kilkeel. We pray for the kingdom of Morn. Remember that, fam that family that have been touched with this tragedy, Lord. We just commit and commend each one to the Lord and pray that you'll draw near and comfort and answer prayer and undertake, we beseech thee. And then, Lord, we pray that you'll bless us even as a church family, that we might be a witness for thee in these days or maybe to reach out to people with the gospel, with comfort, with grief with help and Lord with practical living and we pray Lord too for the wedding on Thursday in the divine will as final preparations have to be made we pray you'll go with Isaac and you'll go with Hannah we pray that you'll remember the McKee and the Skelly family circles as we commend them to God and ask for thy blessing so be with us now and through this day and Father in answer to prayer bless not only here in Cumber but across our province and across our nation where there's a faithful group of thy people both inside and outside Outside our own denomination. Be pleased, Lord, to lay liberally to the charge of those that are faithful to the blood and to the book. And be pleased, Father, to glorify thy Son today. We ask these things in his precious and worthy name. Amen. Could we turn in our Bibles, please, to 1 Chronicles chapter 12? I know we're still continuing in our studies in the life of David. Uh, we have now come to, I think it's the 24th uh, message. Uh, on the life of David. There's still a few more to go. Uh, we're going to finish just briefly, and then next Lord's Day will be the Easter services, and we'll be just changing the emphasis, as you would appreciate. And we'll take a little break next Lord's Day from the life of David, but it's good to have uh, continuity. And we're coming now, as you know, his fugitive years are over. Uh, that is, he's no longer on the run. He's no longer fleeing from Saul. Saul has been killed in battle along with Jonathan and uh, two other of his sons. And now David is seeking the will of God. He has been told by the Lord to go up to Hebron. And it was there that a single tribe, Judah, the only tribe in Israel crowned or anointed him to be king over them. The other 11 tribes, they were reluctant for whatever reason, we don't know. They remained loyal to the house of Saul for a couple of years until Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was put to death by his servants. Abner uh, eventually deflected to the house of David. 
he went round all the elders of Israel and he told them that they should now submit to David and get to Hebron. And there David would be crowned king over a united Israel. And now we come to what is known as the Chronicles. Uh, these are different uh, chronicles of names of different individuals, but they also record for us the exact number and some of the names of individuals who went to Hebron. David was king in Hebron over one tribe for seven and a half years. And then for some 33 years or so, he was king over all Israel. Uh, but we find that folks came to him at Ziklag, and then he moved to Hebron, and then thousands in Israel started to gather. And the Lord tells us here of some of the names of individuals, mighty men, and then the tribes. The wonderful thing about this gathering was they brought with them different personalities. They brought with them different abilities. Some of these tribes would be a great asset to David in battling against the Philistines and recapturing the land, especially Jerusalem. Jerusalem was recaptured for Israel. We know now it's basically in the hands of Arabs. But Jerusalem was captured by Israel and really became the headquarters of the holy city, David's city, when he actually conquered it after he became king over all Israel. And we'll get to that in a few weeks' time. But we have all these tribes coming, and they bring all their instruments of war. Some of them had inventions, and they had made instruments for war that David never had. So they brought that asset to the kingdom, and they brought all different gifts and talents. Just as we rally under King Jesus, David's greater son, we bring different gifts and talents. We bring different personalities and abilities, but they're all a benefit to the kingdom of God and therefore, you see the picture here uh, historically, and you see the picture spiritually, where we bring all our gifts and talents to King Jesus, and we bring all our personalities and all that we have in our skills, and it's all used in the kingdom of God. So that's what you have here in First Chronicles chapter 12. It really is just a little pause in the life of David, where it actually now begins to tell you of the individuals and the tribes that went up to see David. We're breaking at the chapter at the verse 23, and then we're going to read from verse 32 to 40. So 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 23, and it says, These are the numbers of the bands, that is, the captains or the men, that were ready armed to the war, and came to David to Hebron, to turn the kingdom of Saul to him, according to to the word of the Lord. Verse 32. And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200. It sounds small, but they brought their brethren with them, so there were many thousands. And, ver and verse 32. And all their brethren were at their commandment. And of Zebulon, such as went forth to battle, expert in war, with all instruments of war, 50,000, which could keep rank. They were not of double heart. And of Naphtali, a thousand captains. And with them, shield and spear, 30 and 7,000. And of the Danites, expert in war, 20 and 8,000 and 600. And of Asher, such as went forth to battle. That is, they weren't cowards. They were always to the fore. Expert in war, 40,000. And on the other side of Jordan, of the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, with all manner of instruments of war for the battle, and 120,000. All these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart to Hebron to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest also of Israel were of one heart to make David king. And there they were with David three days, eating and drinking, for their brethren had prepared for them. Moreover, they that were nigh them, even unto Issachar and Zebulon and Naphtali, brought bread on asses and on camels and on mules and on oxen, and meat meal, cakes of figs, and bunches of raisins and wine and oil and oxen and sheep abundantly, for there was joy in Israel. Amen. We'll end our reading there. At the verse 40, we know the Lord will indeed bless the public reading of his own precious and 
infallible word. We'll ask our clerk of session, Mr. Alistair, if he'll come, please. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Thank you. Well, good to see you all again. Can I just add my words of welcome to you all? It's good to see uh, so many out at the house of the Lord uh, this morning. We do pray that the Lord will meet with us and bless us uh, in his presence today. Uh, do remember that this afternoon there is that special season of prayer for the work of the Sabbath school. Uh, that's at 3.30 p.m. over in the upper room in the, the, the church hall. So keep that in mind, please. Then, of course, 7 p.m. this evening, this is our family and friends uh, service. And as we have been announcing, our brother, Mr. Chris Killen, will be along. As you know, our brother Chris works amongst uh, those that are uh, plagued by addictions. Uh, and uh, our brother Aidan from the New Hope Centre in Dublin will be along as well to, uh, I think it's actually going to take the form of an interview, uh, but testifying what the Lord has done in his life as well. Of course, supper uh, will be served afterwards. Everyone's encouraged to stay for that. Tuesday evening, 7 p.m., the mustard seat, uh, and it is the uh, prize giving and the parents' evening at the end of this current session. Uh, so uh, do keep that in mind. Uh, and the speaker at that meeting will be Miss Christina Logan. Uh, so keep uh, that in mind, please. Uh, 8 p.m. then on Tuesday, our prayer meeting, time of Bible study. Uh, Friday evening, uh, it is Good Friday, but the Youth Fellowship goes ahead as normal, so uh, remember that, young folks. Next Lord's Day, the service is at the usual times, a quarter past 10, the Sunday school and the Bible class. 11.30, uh, our morning service. Uh, it, not only is it Easter Sunday, but it's the last Lord's Day of the month, so we'll be meeting around the Lord's table uh, after our morning service next Lord's Day. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in the evening time, our gospel service at 7 p.m., our sister, uh, Mrs. Vivian McCoy, will be ministering in song uh, at that service next Lord's Day evening. Do remember, uh, of course, that uh, this un upcoming weekend, the Easter Convention, uh, kicking off on Friday evening. I was just looking down the uh, three evenings. Uh, Friday starts at 8 p.m., Saturday 7.30 p.m., and Monday 7 p.m. So you need to keep those different times in mind because it gets an hour, half an hour earlier uh, at each of the three meetings. But uh, Friday at 8 p.m. is the Youth Rally and Praise Service. Uh, and uh, the Whitfield College uh, students, some will be participating uh, in that meeting, uh, and the Youth Council Choir will be ministering in song. Uh, the speaker on the Friday evening will be the Reverend Timothy Nelson, who of course is the principal of the Whitfield College of the Bible. Uh, then the Missionary Rally on Saturday at 7.30 p.m. Uh, there will be uh, reports from uh, various uh, areas where our, our denomination uh, labors for the Lord at that meeting uh, and the speaker uh, at that missionary rally will be Dr. John McKnight uh, who hails from Maryland in the United States uh, so do keep that in mind as well and then the Monday uh, the convention rally uh, 7 p.m. Uh, the Macrofelt Free Presbyterian Church Choir will be ministering in song uh, and again, the speaker will be Dr. John McKnight. Uh, supper will be served after all of those meetings, so that might encourage you as, as well. Uh, can I just mention then, in relation to the, uh, the week uh, after Easter, uh, as normal, our uh, prayer meeting uh, will be pushed back from the Tuesday night uh, to the Wednesday night because of the holiday period. Uh, so our prayer meeting will be on Wednesday the 3rd of April rather than Tuesday the 2nd. Thank you. I'd like to thank our clerk of session for making those announcements subject as always to 
the divine will of the Lord. Could I say also congratulations to Leah Middleton. She graduated on Thursday evening uh, from the Whitfield Christian Academy with, along with many uh, other young people and some not so young. Uh, we did have a blessed time during uh, those lectures and uh, we trust that the Lord will bless these young people as they have sought to equip themselves in the knowledge of God's word and the various subjects. And uh, if you uh, are desirous to help out or come along and study at the Whitfield Christian Academy. It might be a couple of years before it reaches the County Down area. Uh, they were down in Tandergee in County Armagh, and then they're heading, God willing, in September and for next year down to the west of the band, down toward Clocker Valley. You can still sign up and travel, but it's a bit of a distance, and uh, it lasts from about maybe October right through to March the following year, uh, various uh, classes of study. Uh, great subjects, and uh, we know that the Lord certainly blessed the young people, and uh, some graduated with a distinction and a pass and merit and so on and so on, but they applied themselves and just to see those young people gathered. Uh, you will see the pictures in the Vision magazine of those young ones gathered. It did our hearts good. And then again, to go along to the Scripture Unions in Strangford College just there last uh, Tuesday to have the Senior and Junior Scripture Union be able to speak to those young people. Uh, does your heart good to see young people uh, saved, going on with God, and willing to take a stand for the Lord, both in the spiritual and in the secular? Uh, great encouragement. I was really blessed last week in ministry, just being among these young people and being able to minister to them, uh, to chat to them, and to come alongside them, and to talk to them. It was a real blessing, and I want to thank you for your prayers for those meetings of last week. Uh, could I remind you that um, there will be on Saturday, uh, May the 11th at 1 p.m., uh, an interview with my brother David and I in the Crumlin Road Jail. Victor Maxwell will be interviewing us on our testimonies. We'll be actually in the prison, and there's also a tour of the prison arranged. That's just a little extra. There are tickets for that, by the way. They're priced at £10, not for any money for ourselves. There's no money going to us at all, but simply to raise money for the Air Ambulance Charity. And we know that recently, just down in Kilkeel, there was a need for that, and other places as well, just recently. And if I remember, I think the Air Ambulance for our brother Colin McKee, the time he had the accident on the farm. So we never know how close that will be to us. It's a charity that does need quite a lot of funds. Every single day it takes thousands to keep that our ambulance. So we hope to raise funds for that. Uh, we did the DVD this week. It took us a brave while to get the actual DVD. So the, the, the interview will be very informal on the day in the Crumlin Road Jail. and not be the one you'll see on the DVD. We have already done that. They'll just airbrush all the mistakes out of it. And uh, it'll be a little... Uh, more formal, but the interview will be informal. And there is a number there for tickets. I think Susan Craig will uh, take names as well. So if you would like a ticket for that, or you'd like even to do the tour as well, if you give your name to Susan or myself, I'll pass it on to Susan, and Susan will be looking after that. So there is a poster in the hall. Don't, don't take the poster. I think somebody I left it out last week. Somebody took the poster. Uh, that's not the ticket, by the way. That's just the point. I don't know who took it, but if you could return it, we'd appreciate that. <laughs> Maybe your wallpaper in the house with all the stuff on the table in the hall. I don't know. We'll go into your room, and there's the Vision magazine update in Uganda and the Crumlin Road Jail as well. But if you could return that, we'd appreciate that. For That's just for the notice board, and that's for here in the pulpit. So please keep these things in mind. Number 41, before we come to the preaching of God's word. Number 41, we'll sing verses 1, 3, and 5, all the odd verses. Not because we're odd, uh, but uh, just we want to sing so, some of these verses. Verses 1, 3, and 5, please.
Let's turn again to First Chronicles chapter 12 as we continue in our studies in the life of David. Just with God's word open before us, we'll still our hearts before the Lord in prayer. We'll ask for God's help and blessing. Loving Father, we want to thank thee for worship already today, for the singing of these hymns. We thank thee for redemption ground, the ground of peace. We thank thee for wondrous grace. We bless thee, Lord God, pardons all our sins on redemption ground and the ground of the finished work and the shed blood of the Lamb. We're glad, Lord, that many in this meeting house, those listening through the live stream, are on redemption ground. They're not standing on their own merit, that on the foundation of the church. We bless thee, Lord, they're not standing on, Lord, the merits of the sacraments of the church, but we bless thee, they're on redemption ground. It's the only ground, the only rock upon which we can stand. The work of Christ finished for us at Calvary. And therefore, Father, in the Saviour's name, through the merit of his finished work and shed blood, we approach thee. We thank thee, Lord, for the singing of these hymns, the offering of prayer, the reading of Holy Scripture, even the, the announcements that really are prayer requests for the incoming week. We pray for the Easter Convention. We pray for meetings scheduled this incoming week for our parents' night on Tuesday evening. We ask, Lord, for thy blessing upon everything that's said and done in the house and in the work of God as we commit our way to thee. We thank thee too, Lord, for uh, even this opportunity to hear the word now. And we pray you'll prepare our hearts, take away every distraction, every wandering thought. There's no doubt there are many things that are tugging at the mind. They're pulling at the heart heartstrings. Uh, Lord, they're demanding unnecessary attention for one thing is needful. And like Mary, we will choose that good part today if we sit at thy feet to hear the word at thy mouth. Speak to me today. Let that be our prayer. Speak to me, Lord. Lord, speak to us. Grant that we will hear through the word, the, the very voice of Almighty God. Speak to us, Lord, in tender tones. Lord, speak to us, Lord, and challenge and encourage. And yet, Lord, even convict. And we pray, Lord, you'll answer prayer. To this end, Father, for the preaching and hearing of thy word. I pray for the gracious outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I pray you remember me, thy servant. Lord, forgive me. <laughs> For all my sins. Cleanse me afresh in the precious blood of Christ. Grant to me now the infilling of the Spirit of God for preaching, that anointing, that endowment of power from on high. Take me out of myself and my own human weakness and inability, my own insufficiency in the flesh. And Lord, help me to be cast upon divine omnipotence. Put me on as a mantle. Grant that I may be clothed with the Holy Ghost and with power. Give to me, I pray, Lord, that unction and that energy and that power from on high, the infilling of the Holy Spirit now for the ministry of the Word of God. And Father, in answer now to prayer, save the lost. Restore the backslidden, revive the church. Glorify thy dear Son and the people of God said. Amen. After the death of King Saul, as you would appreciate in our studies in the life of David, David had a very slow ascendancy to the throne of Israel. In fact, it took seven and a half years before all Israel submitted to David's rule as their rightful king under God. But according to the word of the Lord, the kingdom of David had to endure, that it was going to last for generations. Therefore, it had to, I believe, ripen very slowly. It wouldn't come into being by force. David would not coerce the Israelites to submit to his rule. Although he had the authority to do that, he was their rightful king. But he would recognize that my kingdom will endure. You see, Christ would come the greater son of David, and he would be sitting on the throne of David. He will be Israel's rightful king. And therefore, in that sense, David's kingdom would literally last forever and had a very slow ascendancy to the throne because it had to ripen very, very slowly. And David had learned from his mistakes in the past. We have traveled with David. We have seen him on the mountaintop, and we have seen him in the valley. He's a man of like passions as we are, and he failed the Lord miserably on many occasions. But David has learned patience, and he's now waiting on the Lord. In chapter 12 of the Chronicles, we're told that Many men came to David. They brought with them different uh, attitudes, personalities, instruments of war. 
They brought with them courage. They brought with them fortitude. Men who could keep rank. Men who were not of a double heart. That is, they weren't uh, hankering after the house of Saul while submitting under the rule of David. They had a perfect heart to accept David as their rightful king and to submit to his authority and to do what he would have them to do. And these were men under the house of Saul that were trained in war. They were experts. And they brought to David a field of expertise that I don't believe you could have found in the entire created earth in the days of David. David had the best army I know people who study war, they tell us that the Americans, they are the best army in the world because they have this fighting power. They have this, that, and the other. They have the equipment better than any other nation. I looked at some of the figures recently uh, during the war with Israel and Hamas and Ukraine and Russia. I looked at some of the figures that tell us what world powers have by way of planes and jets and fighter jets and their navy. And it seems America is one of those superpowers. Although, when you look at others, it's just not about having more planes than another country. Uh, These men brought skill. They brought wisdom, counsel. They brought expertise. Uh, They were skilled in fighting the Philistines under the rule of Saul, who was a despot, uh, really a man who really... Uh, was forsaken of God and rejected by the Lord. I believe he was a saved man and I believe that Saul is in heaven to this day. But in chapter 12 and verse 1, notice what it says. It says, many join forces with David. Look what it says in chapter 12, verse 1. Now these are they that came to David in Ziklag. Remember when David was there in the land of the Philistines? All of these thousands came to David and then he marched them all up to Hebron where they all made him king for seven and a half years. And we know that it was that length of time before all Israel submitted to David. But what follows in chapter 12 of the Chronicles and verses 23 to 40 is a detailed account of the tribes that actually came. Some individuals are mentioned because there were 30 men that were called mighty men. David's 30 mighty men of war. These were men that followed David. They were his bodyguards. You would see the president coming from the United States to the United Kingdom. If he had a journey into Northern Ireland, you would see this huge entourage of cars. And when he gets out of one of those cars, you'll not know which one it is. There could be 12, all exactly the same. You wouldn't know which one he's in. And then he steps out. And three or four of those cars behind and in front, all these men get out. They're his bodyguards. You ever seen them? And there they are, you'll know them, and they're they're standing taller. I don't believe I could ever make a bodyguard. I couldn't see over the crowd. I couldn't see who's moving behind. And so most of them are all over six foot tall. So they literally can scan above the average height, which is not five foot four like me. I'm sure it's about five foot six or seven, the average height. But there it is, and they're taller. And some tell us that as they're surrounding the president. You see them walking and their their hands by their side. Some tell us it's a fake hand. Their hand literally is inside their jacket on the gun uh, for that millisecond could save the president's life. And we've seen them. And there they are. Well, David had 30 of those men. And they were mighty men of war, each one capable of taking on dozens of the enemy in the Philistines. And they surrounded him. And then all the tribes came and they brought all their fighting men, all their shields and their swords and their arrows. And the Bible also goes on to say they're instruments of war. That is, they had inventions. They probably had engines. That is, they had catapults, mechanically moving, that could fire, maybe uh, balls of fire into a, a place that was a stone wall and a city that was well defended. They brought machinery with them that they had invented for war. These men practiced war night and day, and David had them alongside him. Different tribes, different individuals, all brought with them the weapons of war. But there was one single tribe, and it was not said of them that they brought a single item for war. Not one single item. Yet David found in this tribe, 
The greatest benefit to his kingdom was not in the other 11 tribes, but in this one single tribe. They brought something to David and to the kingdom of David and to the house of David and to all Israel that no other tribe brought. No other tribe possessed. This tribe alone brought something to David that would be a greater asset than instruments of war would be a greater instrument than men who could keep rank that is in the face of the enemy. They would not break rank. They would not flee. They will die on the battlefield and they'll die alongside their comrades. And if one dies, we all die. They could keep rank. That's what it means. And there were men who came and they didn't have a double heart. That meant they were loyal to David. And whatever David commanded, whatever battle he was in, they would die for him. But there was a single tribe and they never brought any of those things to David. But they brought something to David that he could never do without. That his fighting men were useless without. They brought a very special skill. They brought a gift and a talent. They brought something to the table that David recognized as the best gift that God could give to David when he reigned as king over all Israel. Among them was a tribe by the name of Issachar. And if you notice with me, instead of bringing their skill with sword and spear and bow and arrow and chariot, look what they brought to David. Look at verse 32. Look what they brought to David. Verse 32 tells us, and it says, And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Now think of it. What good are men of war if you send them out without knowing what they're doing, where they're going, how to fight, or even when to fight? These men of Issachar brought a skill set to David and laid it on the table. And the Bible says there was no bow and arrow, no sword or shield, but there were men who had understanding of the times in which they were living. They were able to discern the mind of God and the will of God for Israel. They knew when to instruct David to go to war and when not to. They knew what city to take and what city not to take. They knew that when David should sit still and do nothing and be patient. And they had understanding of the times. They knew how God was working in the nation. They knew what the will of God was for his people. No other tribe had that skill set. And this tribe Issachar brought to David something that David would value more than a sword or shield, a bow or an arrow. A piece of armor, or a spear, or a chariot, or any other instrument of war for that matter. They brought their understanding of the times. And they knew of a certainty what Israel ought to do. And I want to tell you, if you bring that up to our modern day, in the kingdom of Christ, under the rule of David's greater son, our King Jesus, to one to which we submit, not with a double heart, not that we would ever want to break rank. We would come well equipped with the armor of God, with the sword of the Spirit, and the shield of faith, and the helmet of salvation, and the breastplate of righteousness, and the belt of truth around our, our waist, and the shoes upon our feet, the gospel of peace symbolizing that we might march for King Jesus, that we might do war for the Lord. But I'll tell you this, what use is that a fighting army without discernment, understanding of the mind and will of God? able to discern the times. You see, there are Christians today and they cannot discern the times in which we're living. We're in what is known as the last of the last days. I do not know. I do not know when the Lord will return. But when I look at prophecy and see so much of it fulfilled in the last 10 years, when I see the world's economy about to fall, when I see that the stage is set for the rise of the Antichrist, if he's not already in the earth, 
alive and well today. And it's only a matter of taking control of the Middle East and bringing peace to the world. The man of sin, the Antichrist, the man of peace, he'll bring prosperity financially. You see, if people put money in your pocket, you'll vote for them. You'll stand alongside them, no matter about your principles. If they'll put money in your pocket, if they'll give you your pay rise and your greater pension, you'll vote for them. You'll support them. That's what's going to happen. I do not know how long this earth has left. I don't know how long it is until the Lord returns. What if? And when you look at prophecy, it's short. It could be in single figures in years. Four years. I don't know how long we have left. Ten years maximum. I don't know. But we need to understand the times in which we're living. And time is short. And you and I need to bring to the table. Not our weapons of war. We need to bring to the table what the men of Issachar had. Understanding the times in which you live. And then you ought to know what we should be doing. You see the church today. We know what they're doing. They listen to me. I am not opposed to practical works. I believe Christianity is the most practical religion in the world. But we have churches springing up today and they're no longer seeing the spiritual. Do you know what they're doing? And I'm not opposed to this, by the way. And maybe you get this done by these churches. I don't know. But you know what? They understand the times. This is what the church needs to do today. We need to go into the community and we need to paint over the graffiti. That's their ministry. We need to clear up the litter from the streets. Sure, look at the streets. They're filthy. We need to go and clear that area. So let's get our church together. Let's go into the community and we'll cut the grass for the pensioner. Can you call them that today? For the senior citizen. Let's get politically correct. For the senior citizen. Let's cut their grass. I'm not opposed to that. I'm not opposed to you lifting litter. I'll be opposed to you throwing it down. But is that understanding the times in which we live? Has God called us primarily to paint over the graffiti? Because once you do it, they'll repaint with their graffiti. Is the church called to go out primarily and cut the grass and lift the litter? Is it? Is the church called primarily? And I'm not opposed to this. To open up the food bank. To feed the poor. I'm not opposed to that. We give, and I trust we'll give generously to worthy causes like that. But if we understand the times in which we're living. If we know what Israel ought to do. Then I believe we bring a mindset and a skill set to the table that no one else can bring. And as a church, as a local congregation of a denomination and many others outside of our denomination, we need to understand the times in which we're living. And we need to bring these qualities to the table. I want to think today of the men of Issachar and what they brought to the table for David to enhance the kingdom. And I want to bring it into the modern age in which we're living because we're serving under King Jesus, David's greater son. It's the same kingdom that David was in, the kingdom of God. And even King David submitted to King Jesus. And the Bible teaches us that we're under his authority. And we want to be like the men of Issachar. We want to be men and women of understanding of the times. And we ought to know what Israel ought to do. And I want you to think of that title today, Understanding the Times, in light of the men of Issachar, what they brought to David. And I want you to think, first of all, of their discernment. Their discernment. Notice what it says in verse 32. It says they had understanding of the times and they knew what Israel ought to do. In fact, that word understanding and that word know or knew is exactly the same Hebrew word. It's exactly the same. I think it's the word yada. It's exactly the same word. So they had knowledge and understanding. They had discernment. For that's what the word re really means. It means to discern and then you know. Once you discern, do you know what it's like? Some people have good, good qualities. They're able to discern people's character. I know one man, 
And I, and I worked alongside with him for many years. It's not Dr. Douglas, by the way. He has great discernment too. Just a, a, what we call an ordinary Christian. I worked alongside him. And he, and he had tremendous discernment in character. And he would have said to me at times, just you be careful there. I saw nothing. But he was able to discern and know. And all of a sudden, he just had this, like you think he had an alarm bell going off. Just, just watch. Just be careful. And I do not know there was ever a time he was wrong. I don't believe, I can't remember a single time where I went back and said, hey boy, you were wrong about that person and those people. I don't believe there was a single moment. And he just seemed to discern. And then he knew what to do. And he often told me, be careful. Don't go anywhere near that. Don't touch that. Keep away from it. And he was right. I can't remember a single moment. But I want to tell you this. These individuals had understanding of the times. They knew instinctively what God was doing in the nation. They knew, could, could you say that now? What is God doing in Great Britain, in the United Kingdom? What is he doing? What is he doing? Well, if we don't know what God is doing, how can we follow him? Maybe there's no discernment in this preacher. What is God doing? The world tells me nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. He's divorced from our country. And there are Christians who have said, I quote, God has forsaken us and we have put him out of the nation. Is that true? Is that how you understand? What's God doing? Well, I want to tell you what he's doing. I'll tell you what he is doing. He's building his church in the United Kingdom. He's calling out a people in the United Kingdom. He's saving in the United Kingdom. And he's been doing it here in Cumber. And we discern that God is working. Not at the pace that you would like. Not in the manner and way that you would like and I would like in revival. But he's building his church. And therefore we can go out and evangelize with confidence and, and certainty. Understanding the times. God is never idle. And a nation cannot hinder the word of God. And he cannot stop the church and the onward march of truth. And I'll tell you what God is doing. God is still on the march. And God is still on the throne. And God's still ruling in the United Kingdom. And he'll raise one up. And he'll put another down. And God will sort matters out according to his divine will. And I'm not so much as interested in elections and so on and so on. My focus at the present primarily, and I'm not opposed to those things, is the kingdom of God. What's God going to do? And I believe he's working. I believe it's his will to save and to call a people out for himself. I don't believe the Lord is finished with the United Kingdom. I don't believe that. I don't believe Christians who tell me that God has abandoned us. I don't believe that. We're a new covenant with God. I know that. We're no mini Israel. We're not. It's a foolish notion to think that Britain and America are little mini Israels. We're not. We're Gentile nations brought into the true vine, Christ, grafted in after the Jews rejected their Messiah. When God turned to the Gentile nations and is calling out his church from among the Gentiles. And that's all we are. But I discern God's working and moving. So it's incumbent upon us as God's people to discern the times in which we're living. And therefore, there's things we need to be doing. There are many things. I can't uh, tell you them all here today. But I'll tell you this. We need to be standing for truth. If God's still on the throne, no one has disposed of him. No one has cast him out. Government legislation cannot legislate against the law of God. It stands forever. You need to be on the side of truth. And we need to stand up for truth today. There are lies being told. Lies being told about Jesus Christ. About the church. Lies being told about the person and work of Christ. Lies being told about the way of salvation. And we need to stand up for what is right and what is truthful. And it's not going to be easy. When you side with truth, you're a minority. When you side with the truth of God, you're a minority inside a minority. 
And many like to stand with the lie because it has popular opinion and it has the plaudits of your fellow peers and also those around you. And they can pat you on the back whenever you take a a liberal stand on certain issues. I want to tell you doctrinally, we need to stand upon the word of God. We need to stand for the gospel and we need to preach that gospel because it's the only answer to the need of mankind. The only answer to cumber is the gospel of Christ. And there are people in this town who have told us to stay within the four walls of your church because nobody wants you out there. Well, they may not want us, but they need us. And they need the truth. And I don't care what comes your way or mine, what persecution we get, what they do to us on Facebook. They can do what they like, but I'm telling you, we need to take our stand in this town for truth. And we need to preach Christ as the only hope of salvation. And we need to evangelize. We're not out there to make people free Presbyterians. We wouldn't cross the street for that. You've heard me say it on numerous occasions, and you'll hear me on dozens more times as well. But we need to stand for truth. Quickly, we need to supplicate the throne. We need men and women of prayer. If you understand the need of the hour, you would understand that we need to be on praying ground. We need to be in touch with God. We're no use to the Lord if we're not on praying ground. Did you know that? Absolutely no use. We will become a prey to the devil if we're not on praying ground. I'd never do this in a congregation, but I would love to do it now. And just ask you one by one, just one by one, to be honest. I'm not going to do it. Just to stand up now. Just stand up now, but I'm not going to do it. But in your mind, you answer Truthfully, are you on praying ground right now, right this moment? I'm not asking, will you be this afternoon? I'm not asking, will you be next week? From last Sunday to this, are we on praying ground? Are we in touch with the Lord? Because if we've got understanding of the times in which we live, we need to live close to the Lord. It's a dangerous world, young person. A very dangerous world you're living in. There's the dangers in the internet. There's the danger, and I know there are young children here, and there are young people gathered and young adults. You need to be careful. And I know it's, it's, it's laughed at in the house. Look at them, they're always on their phone. They're always on their phone. My wife and I were out there just a few days ago, and we went into a little cafe, and there's this couple that came, and they ordered their coffee, and they ordered their, their tray back, and they were sitting there on their phones, and their coffee was getting cold, and their tray back, I was just drooling all over it. You know what I mean? Well, you're not going to eat that. I'll eat it. <laughs> you can have the coffee, but I'll take the tray back. But I want to tell you, they sat on their phones. I even said to June, look at them. And they weren't young people. <laughs> They weren't, and they were on, and maybe it was Facebook, and they were reading comments, and they're maybe TikTok and going through the videos. And I thought to myself, you could walk over and clear their table, and they wouldn't even know. And they'd probably say, here, you didn't bring my coffee. Just on their phones. But young people, it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. You could be opened up to anything. I could name them, but there's young children here, and I don't want to. But we need to be careful and we need to supplicate the throne. We need to be in touch with the Lord. There are people in this town of Cumber and this district right across the North Down area. I want to tell you something. They need our prayers. We need to pray for them. They cannot pray for themselves. And we need to pray that God would be merciful to them. There's homes that are destroyed by sin in this town. And I want to tell you, mental health problems, all as a result of immoral, sinful, wicked living. Depression, self-harm, it's all there. The results of sin. The program, programs and schemes of men, uh, they will touch the surface. They will make an attempt. We could never condemn them if we're doing nothing. But do we believe that Christ is the answer? You'll hear the testimony tonight of Aidan Curran. Most of his family are dead because of heroin addiction. Dead. He himself was basically beaten to death and he was buried in a shallow grave. They left him for dead and they buried him in a shallow grave. He survived it. He's alive tonight to tell you that Christ was the answer for him and his family and the addiction that he had. And friends, if we really believe that, we should be praying then 
and standing up for truth. And then we should be strong in our testimony, their discernment. That is, we should live our lives pure and clean. We should have a strong testimony. I want to tell you this, friends. It's not popular in Christian circles today. But we have Christians now who run to the pleasure places of this world and think nothing of it. No testimony. There are Christians who take cigarettes and vape. There are Christians today who have their, their body covered in tattoos and, and, and they've got them as professing believers. They call it now body art as opposed to tattoo. They have piercings today. There are ministers, ministers who stand as pastors in this province and they have their ears pierced and they have tattoos. And I want to tell you, we have multitudes of Christians who take alcohol. And I think for testimony's sake alone, we should abstain from alcohol because of the evils that's associated with it and the lives that are being destroyed. Some believers today think nothing of doing the lottery, scratch cards, trying to earn money without literally working hard for it. There are Christians today who just can cohabit, just cohabit, and think nothing of living with a, another Christian for years with no conviction. I tell you, if you discern the times in which we live, when, when is it ever called out among young people? I called it out to a young person the other day, just the other day. When is it ever called out that what you're doing, cohabiting, is sinful? When is it called out? Because it's not called out and there's no stand for truth and there's no strong testimony for Christ. We don't understand the times in which we're living. They just go ahead and do it. They didn't even know it was wrong. For nobody tells them. Nobody tells them that God's ideal is to keep your life pure before you're married. And then after that, you can move in. You can set up your home, etc., etc. Their discipline. I want you to think, or sorry, their discernment. I want you to think thirdly, or secondly, and very quickly. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Their discipline. Notice what it says in verse 32. And we'll finish here and just one other little concluding point. Look what it says there in verse 32. And all their brethren were at their commandment. Do you see it? Their discipline. All their brethren were at their commandment. Look at verse 38. And these men of war that could keep rank with a perfect heart. Now think of it. Their brethren were under their commandment. That's a remarkable thing. They were under their authority. And it says they could keep rank. They wouldn't break away from that authority. And what do we have today? Friends, listen to me. There has never been in my entire years as a believer on this earth more parachurch organizations than there is today. And what is said about them? Nothing. 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 Where are the established church and where is their voice against the parachurch organizations that are springing up? Do they have the right to leave a church for no reason? No doctrinal reason. No moral reason. No reason. Just because they don't get their way in the church or don't get a position in the church or don't get recognized in the church, they start their own church. Is that scriptural? You ever think about that? Maybe you support churches like that. Maybe you support places like that. Maybe you give credence to individuals who are really like a parachurch organization. Can I tell you something? That Christ has set the government in his church, not us. Not the brethren. Not the free Presbyterians. Not the congregation. Not the Methodist or the Presbyterian or the Church of Ireland. Not the Pentecostal. I want to tell you, Christ has set government in the church. And under his authority in the church, under his government, we submit ourselves. And today, there are many who are breaking ranks. And they're shifting and they're moving away. I challenged one man, one man. I challenged him. And I says to him, who are you accountable to? Who are you accountable to? Scripturally, you should be under authority. You should be under the authority of a local church, one of Christ's churches. I don't care what denomination it is. I don't care. 
I'm telling you, you should be under authority to that local church or to a body. And he said to these words to me, he says, I am. I says, who? And he says, I have a board. I says, well, tell me this. And I knew full well, does your board ever meet? No, your board doesn't meet. No, it doesn't. Do you ever talk to them about your work? No. Do you ever ask them counsel or advice? No. Do they ever tell you what to do? No. So they're a ghost board that exists on paper so that you, and I said this to him, so that you can get your charitable status. So you don't have to pay your VAT and your tax and the thousands you're pulling in. And you're under no authority. And whenever you want to make a decision, you look in the mirror and you make your decision there. And he laughed. Now he, he laughed and he says, you're right. You're exactly right. He said that himself. If I was to bring him to this house, it wouldn't be possible. If I was to bring him here right now and said, it's not the truth. He would concur with what I said. Under no authority, but their discipline. They were able to keep rank. Now we have people today and they move from one place to the other. They move from one church to the next. And if a new church springs up and the buzz is there, they'll go along to that place. If the crowd's there, they'll follow the crowd. And they'll abandon the local assembly. They refuse to come under Christ's church. They'll go to a parachurch. There's no authority there. In fact, one church in particular I'm thinking of right now was born out of what? And I remember the fellow telling me why he was doing it and, and the reasons he said were not scriptural. Were not scriptural. I know people who have passed through the ranks of that church and they have said, you can say nothing and do nothing. He's the boss. He, he's literally the, the director of everything. He makes every decision. And if he doesn't like you and your face doesn't fit, then he just chases you. Because he has such a turnover of individuals, he doesn't really care. There's no pastoral work there. There's no prayer for individuals there. I said to one girl who was in a church, now listen to me. I said, and my wife was with me, I said to one girl who was in a church, I says, do you know such and such in your church? And she says, ah, what's the name again? I told him the name. And she said, no, no, I don't. And the reason why I asked it was because the young girl had died of cancer. And he says, how do you not know? How long have you been in that church? And she told me this. 15 years I've been there. 15 years and you don't know that that young girl in her early 20s going to your church died of cancer and you don't know. And here's what she said to me. Ah, but there's so many young people pass through our church. We never get to know them. Never get to know them. Wow. Is that... Christ's church that he established and died for. That a young girl could die of cancer and a communicant member wouldn't even know. That's sad, but it's true. You see, so many are breaking rank today. But what did the men of Issachar bring to the kingdom of David as you and I should bring to the kingdom of Christ? Discernment and discipline. Not breaking rank. Sticking by the stuff. When things get tight in the children's work, you don't quit. When things are tough and parents are complaining about the youth work, you don't throw the towel in. When someone in the church says something about you or does something on you, you don't say, that said, I've had enough. Because see, when you move to another church, someone else will do the same. And you know what you'll do? I'll tell you what you'll do. You'll do exactly what I heard a man and a woman tell me just two days ago. We go nowhere now. We just listen online. That's what they told me. Friends, the Lord wants you in the local church and he wants you loyal, faithful, digging in, holding rank, not breaking, and under the command of King Jesus. There's one Final thought, and it's this. Understanding the times, their discernment, their discipline, and finally, their devotion. Verse 39 and 40, we'll not read it, but I'll say to you the, the summary of it. They were with David three days. That's the perfect number, completion. Eating and drinking, why? For there was joy in Israel. I want to tell you, I think of their delight. The men of Issachar joined with their fellow brethren, and they were delighted under the rule of David. You see, when we submit to Christ as our king, 
when we live to serve and work for him in the local assembly, when we bring everything we have to the table for the kingdom of God's sake, I tell you there's joy, there's delight in being where the Lord wants you to be. And I believe Christ, or David is a type of Christ here, and Christ ruling in the hearts of his children, Christ king in his church, believers united, holding rank under the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ is cause for great rejoicing and happiness and blessing when there's unity and no division and no fallout and no breaking of rank and members are submissive one to the other and they love one another and they have one aim, one desire to serve Christ, to honor him, to share Christ with our fellow man, to reach beyond the four walls of our church and to reach out to our fellow man in Cumber, in Newton Ards, in, in Ballystockard, in Money Ray, in Lisby, in Baloo, in Kalinchy and further afield for that matter and to bring the gospel to them and to help them and pray for them. I want to tell you there's not the like of it. I want to finish with one word from the Lord for you today. I want you to turn here with me in chapter 12 and look at verse 18 and here we'll finish. Look what it says in verse 18 and I want to leave this with you. Then the Spirit came upon Amaziah who was chief of the captains, and he said, Thine are we, David, and on thy side, thy son of Jesse. I want to take those words today, and will you do the same with me? I want them now to be raised to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you as a believer to say this right now, right now, as a child of God, born again of God's Spirit. I want you to say, Thine are we, Jesus, and on thy side, thy Son of God. Thine are we, David, and on thy side, thy Son of Jesse. Thine are we, Jesus, and on thy side, thy Son of God. Father in heaven, do bless that only which has been of thyself today. Grant that we may leave this house now prayerfully and very, very carefully, pondering the things we have heard. Take us to our homes in safety. May the word of God burn into our hearts. May it bless our souls. Grant that it may be received as it is, the engrafted word of God, not as the words of men or man. Grant, Lord, you'll take that which is of thyself and own it, back at home and burn it in and bless it to every heart. May we leave the house now prayerfully, and very carefully, pondering the things we have heard, write them indelibly upon the tables of our heart, and may we seek to be doers and not hearers only of the word, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.